Jing Zheng and I will be presenting uh, a bit uh, of um, machine learning uh, applications in silicon photonics. So uh, we'll start by answering the question why uh, silicon photonics? And this is basically because uh, lately uh, silicon photonics gained a lot of interest due to its ability to support higher data rates, lower latency communication, biosensing, and a lot of other novel applications. <clears throat> However, in silicon photonics, um, the, the infrastructure of the already, uh, the, the existing infrastructure of CMOS is used in uh, fabricating uh, the optical components. And this means that the process variations found in uh, CMOS are inherently transferred to the optical components. And these variations can be either systematic variations like the width and thickness variations, or they can be random like the line. And this uh, inheritance of process variations represents a key challenge for silicon photonics, which is the lack of variation in other uh, models that can predict the performance of optical components in the presence of this process. A starting step for developing this variation aware uh, models is uh, the knowledge of the process variation distribution map across the world. And this is basically what we will present uh, today, uh, where we try to uh, get a sense or the, uh, <clears throat> get a sense of the of the process variation distribution map across a week. And to do so, uh, we uh, started with a test structure, which is the uh, silicon uh, nitride uh, uh, rib ring resonator, as shown here. And uh, it was fabricated uh, a total of 48 rings with different uh, radius varying from 20 to 150 microns. And the uh, varying gap is from 0.6 to 1.6 uh, microns. And for each one of these 48 things, uh, the, <clears throat> the performance is, uh, or the transmission is uh, measured across the uh, um, uh, wavelength of interest. And the goal of this uh, test structure, as we mentioned, is to extract the geometric variations across the wafer, which can be used to, uh, to, uh, to, know, of, uh, to know the process uh, variation distribution map. And the method we will use for this um, uh, for for this uh, for this development of the uh, process variation distribution map is that we will start with the measurement data we have, from which we will uh, extract some of the features uh, of the of the ring uh, of the ring uh, uh, response parameters, and we will use these parameters to. Uh, further calculate some of the ring properties, uh, which we will compare with the nominal case uh, in order to extract the geometric variation. And to go in more detail of each one of these steps, uh, we will start with the feature extraction. To extract the feature from this response, we, uh, we, will, uh, we will start by detrending or flattening this response to get rid of the effect of the measurement. Uh, Setup, um, and we will use this uh, this uh, this response to uh, to calculate the different uh, resonance frequencies uh, across the wavelength of operation. Uh, calculate the free spectral range, which is the distance between any two uh, adjacent resonances. Calculate the extinction extinction ratio, which is the uh, ratio between the maximum and the minimum transmission. And finally, calculate the finesse, which is uh, the ratio between the free spectral range and the full width path maximum at each of the operating wavelengths. After uh, extracting these parameters, we will use them uh, uh, to calculate the, the effective index uh, with, not, with our knowledge of the resonance frequency uh, and calculate the effective group index of the ring with the knowledge of the resonance frequency frequency and the free spectral range. And knowing the extinction ratio and the finesse and the finesse, we can see that both of them uh, have param have parameters we care about, which is the loss uh, across the wafer uh, alpha and the coupling um, 
uh, and the coupling of the of the ring which is C. So solving these two equations together, we will be able to find the the coupling coefficient and the loss. One thing to note is that when solving the extinction ratio and the finesse, we will have uh, uh, it's a second order, uh, it's a second degree uh, equation. So we will have two answers, but we are not sure which one of them is the coupling coefficient and which one is the loss. But one interesting fact is that we know about the rings is that for the same radius, uh, the, ring, the rings will have the similar loss and accordingly we can uh, specify which one is the loss and which one is, is the coupling. And also we know that for the same gap width, uh, the rings will have similar coupling and accordingly uh, we will one more time be able to specify or differentiate between the coupling and the loss. So now uh, extracting all of the information we can get from the uh, our test structure, we will uh, we will use the, the difference in uh, in these uh, parameters, uh, which is the effective index, the the group refractive, uh, the group uh, index, and the coupling. Comparing them to the nominal case, we can simply relate this difference from the nominal case to variations in the actual geometry of the fabricated one from the design geometry based on what we call the sensitivity matrix that uh, that specifies how the effective index group index or and the coupling vary with varying any of these geometric components the width thickness and height but we have some challenges for this extraction um, and this can uh, Jing Zhang will tell us more about this okay thanks Shari. so yeah, so basically, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So um, this is Shelly told us about the general flow workflows about how we try to extract all these process variations from our measurement data. But, um, there's um, some of the challenges we're, we're facing when we're trying to use this simple kind of workflow. So. Firstly, is that actually we are trying to extract this kind of variations from the from the deviations of this kind of uh, physical properties. But actually, all these deviations is a mix of the variation and the measurement noise. And in some cases, the noise is so large that where uh, it, it is almost overwhelming, and we are unable to actually extract the actual variation. And there's an, uh, what's more is that actually the sensitivity matrix has some kind of like ear condition. It's kind of ear condition. Here we're showing like the conditioning number of the, all the different sensitivity matrix for different devices. And all of them are kind of very large to be a few hundreds. So uh, a large conditioning number basically means that the a small um, error in the input is going to cause a large um, error in the output. So when we are looking at this kind of equations, so when we are having a small kind of noise when we are trying to extract these kind of deviations in the properties, it is going to end up being a large noise when we are trying to com uh, convert it into the uh, process variations in the geometry. So in the end, when we are trying to just use this kind of vanilla simple approach, it is going to give us some number of this kind of deviations to be very huge, to be even to be larger than the actual thickness or the weight of the actual structure. So another issue is that, well, uh, as I talked about, when we are trying to calculate this kind of deviations, we need to compare the result from the measurement to the uh, nominal value, which is coming from the simulations. But since this is a difference between two values, so basically a small error in our simulations of the nominal value is going to cause a large impact on the deviation as well. The third issue is that when we are trying to calculate the effective index, there's actually an unknown integer, which is the mole number here. 
And basically the ways we're trying to solve this kind of integer is that we compare the uh, effective index calculated by different integers to the nominal values coming from the simulations. And we pick the one that is the nearest to our nominal value. That is, um, that is a good approach when this kind of distributions is um, much smaller than the gap between the different modes. But when the, the, when the period gap becomes smaller, then it is kind of having this kind of unwrapping issues. So we don't know which kind of mode is the actual mode where we need to calculate. And the fourth one is actually not a challenge, but something we can improve is that in the formal approach, we're actually trying to find the, this kind of relation between the geometry variations to the physical uh, properties at one certain wavelength. But actually what we can do is that we can just expand it to becoming like the geometry variations, uh, the relationship between the geometry process variations to the to a lot of different wavelengths this, where we have this kind of data for the resonance uh, wavelength for the effective index and couplings. So this is going to give us more information and maybe also give us more robust results about you know, what we're trying to extract in the process variations. But, um, this is going to, but this is absolutely going to be more difficult and complicated than just trying to do this kind of um, like one-on-one -on -one kind of like uh, kind of like relationship. But um, we're going to show the solutions for both the single wave inference and the multi wave inference in later. But, um, basically, for the final result, we're using this kind of multi wave inference, but single wave inference is more uh, is easier to understand for some of the issues. So now we're going to, going to talk about how we. Yeah? Okay. So, yeah, so now we're trying to talk about how. We're trying to solve all the challenges we just mentioned. So, firstly, it's the one about we're having a, um, the measurement noise mixing with the um, variations we're trying to uh, extract it. Uh, we're trying to extract. So, one thing that is noticed when we're trying to do this kind of extraction of the properties is that actually the deviations from the geometry variations actually behaves differently from the uh, from the from the deviation caused by the measurement noise. So here is one device we have and this is the group index for different resonant peaks for this one devices. And as you can see that there's kind of like this kind of um, this kind of fluctuations in the data. So basically all these kind of fluctuations, we can see that this is actually caused by the measurement noise. Because if there's the kind of geometry variations to the structures, then all the group index data will just deviate for, uh, in the same directions. So, um, but the measurement noise is more random. And so, so this is a little bit like the measurement noise is going to be behave more like a random noise, but the process variations deviation is going to behave more like a systematic uh, uh, variation. So in this way, for the single wave the inference, we have a very simple way that is we're trying to just fit for this, do a fitting of these curves and we're using the fitting result as the ones we're using for the extraction. And also from the fitting, we can have this kind of estimations for how much the noise level is for this one. So we actually also kind of have um, have another have a way to kind of know how much of the noise it is when we are trying to estimate the value. So yeah, so so there's a way to estimate the noise level in the group index and also we did the same thing for the effective index and the coupling as well. But this is not super fair when, when, when we're trying to do the multi-wavelength inference 
because they were unable to kind of assign this kind of noise level to each of these kind of data points because of this kind of fitting approach is going to assign and just, just, just going to assign one noise level for all the data points, which is not actually so much suitable for this case. But uh, we come up. So we came up with another approach to, to trying to model in this kind of noise level, which is based on the assumption that the noise is going to be like a Gaussian noise in the measurement data. And then we are try, uh, can try to model the extraction error from the from how we how how we kind of extract the all, all these kind of phases from the spectrum, and th this can be done by uh, part, partly by the theory which we can find how this like resonant frequencies and also the extinction ratios and the cleanness is going to be related to some of the properties that we can actually obtain from the from each of the devices, and then. Um, this kind of uh, proportional uh, relationship base from the just from theory, and then we can use some kind of things that synthetic data experiment to determine the actual factors in the in this relationship. And so there's uh, some of the testing we did based on this kind of modeling of the error level. You can see that actually it kind of um, so. Um, okay. In the left, it is the ones for group index, and on the left is uh, on the right is the coupling coefficient. And one can see that uh, so for different colors, uh, each different color is one different devices. And so as you can see, here, like the blue one seems to have a larger noise, and for the uh, uh, than the others, so it kind of have this kind of correct trend to capture which one is going to have a large error. But the issue is that it seems like that the actual level is a little bit too small, especially for the blue devices case here. And it is a little bit like the same for in the right for the coughing as well. So um, it, it kind of, this might be the result of like, oh, we're doing something that is not actually happening in the measurement, like we assume the noise is a Gaussian noise, but that might not be true for the measurement data. But something very simple we can do is that just to add like a scaling factors to make it to, um, to be more realistic compared to the data. So there's some different ways to choosing this scaling factors. So the most simple way is just to manually set the fixed values, but also we can actually try to estimate the scaling factors from the wave and fading. It's kind of like trying to spot this kind of difference between the different resonant, uh, resonant frequencies and trying to scale the air bar so that it looks more like a straight line for the group index case here. And yeah, so basically, it works mostly like a weighted fitting problems when we're trying to estimate the scaling factors from the data. So um, now we're trying to incorporate the knowledge we have for the extraction errors to see how we, we can try to separate the errors from the geometry variations better. So as you will, what we're trying to do is to have a Bayesian inference approach. And in this way, we can split the actual measurement data into four different parts. The first part is the nominal values, which is partially coming from the simulations, but we're trying to make it like a linear fitting problems, like to trying to shift it a little bit or trying to um, stretch it a little bit so that it be more like the uh, trying to trying to reduce the error from the nominal simulations, and the second part is the part we actually want. It is the deviations from the geometry um, variation. 
which is connected to connected to this um, y, which is the uh, uh, probabilities deviations by the uh, effector index and coupling coefficient and group index by this kind of sensitivity s, which is might be different for different device. And the second, uh, third part is what we just talked about the measurement noise. We actually, now we have like the estimation for the noise level of this kind of extraction noise. And the fourth part is the, is the mode, is the mode number, it's kind of like the mode number when we're talking about the effector index. So this is like, uh, the difference between when we're uh, the difference when we're choosing different mode numbers and this mode gap here. So um, now the problem is that we have all this kind of um, measurement data yi, and we have our design on this kind of linear fading AI, and we have this SI sensitivity from the from our simulation, and we also have an estimation about the distribution of the extraction error. And also we have this delta i basically from the physical model. So now the issue is the how to use this to try to estimate the w, which is the parameters for the fitting and the mole number and i, and also what is the distributions of the pi. Actually the uh, most important thing we want to know is that distribution of the covariance of the PI here is um, lambda in, in race of the lambda here. So um, in order to solve this kind of uh, basic inference problem, we actually started from a more simple like 1D toy problem. So which is actually still in the same forms like, but now we're just using a 1D kind of toy data to play around with the idea. So for the toy problems, here the yi is just the 1D number, which is um, the same like we have a, like a nominal value, which is a fitting functions, which we use the same, same idea as the real problems, which is like a shift and also trying to stress from the values we coming, assuming this is coming from the sim nominal simulations and the second one is the residual, which is what we want. And we, we want to know about the distribution, um, specifically the variance of the residual. The third one is the noise, which we know this kind of, the noise level, the sigma i squared here. And the fourth part is the mole number part, which is the same as in the real problem. Um, this is an example where we saw how uh, uh, one of the generated example of this kind of toy problems. So for the blue and the red and yellow, uh, three different uh, other data with the three different mode and I showing here. And the black uh, dash line is the actual, actual, mm, uh, it's the actual fitting function, uh, the ground truth of the function F data here. So um, the way we're trying to solve this problem to get this kind of sigma square and also the fitting parameters data here is that we use the AM algorithm. And in simple forms, the, it, it, intuitively it works like we're trying to estimate the the posterior distributions of the clean data, which is the nominal values plus the residual here from the from the likelihood estimated from the um, data. And also we have the prior of the fitting parameters and the uh, distribution of the residual. And from this kind of posterior distributions, we're trying to do something like a weighted fitting to get a new theta and a sigma. And then we use the new sigma and theta and sigma as the prior to update the prior distributions of the clean data and iterate these two steps until it converts. And this algorithm actually works pretty good for these toy problems. So 
Yeah, so that it actually converts to the um, variance pretty quick. And also we can kind of have this kind of reconstructed clean data from the EMR then because we kind of have the posterior distribution estimated for each of the clean data. And so it is also looks pretty close to the actual distributions. But there's two things that little we mentioned is that as it we we kind of need a good initialization for this problem. Otherwise it is going to be trapped in the local optimal, which is kind of like a bad news. But the good news is that even if we're trapped in a local minimal, then uh, still this kind of estimate variance is not as you very wrong. It is still around the true values, even in this kind of bad case. So now we're coming back to our real problems, but basically there's kind of like um, something new we need to do for the real problem. So firstly is that it is a multi-dimensional problem. So now all the yi's are the effects the index and the coupling coefficient at all the different resonant frequencies. That is for the multi-wavelength inference. And even for the single wavelength case, the YI is still like three different numbers. Uh, it is still a, um, a vector in the in a three-dimensional space where the effect index, group index, and the coupling coefficient. So it is a multi-dimensional problem. And also, we have an, this kind of extra S sensitivity matrix. So the observation data and the, the value we actually need, the process uh, variation is actually defined in two different spaces. For the multi-dimensional problem, these two are actually even have the different dimension. And, uh, and so when we are trying to look at these problems, then the the fitting parameters are defined in the Y space, while the lambda, which is the distributions of the PI, are defined in the P space. So there needs to be a way to try to build the connections between these two spaces, which is actually based on this kind of bridging of this S parameters. Oh, no, no, it's nice. It's the sensitivity matrix here. So, um, but the basic idea is almost the same as the 1D cases. It still looks like we're trying to estimate the posteriors of the clean data, so which we label as Y hat here, from, from the, the guess we already have for the lambda and the W here. And then we're trying to update the distributions of variance and also the, the uh, fitting parameters based on the posteriors we already have. So um, also in the M state, it still looks pretty much like a weighted fading problems, but the E step looks a little bit messy, but basically it is still trying to incorporate the parts of the measurement noise and the mole gap altogether. And something that's worth noting is that you can see this kind of lambda here is always combined with the sensitivity matrix S for here and here. So that is actually trying to kind of like, you can think about it as we're trying to map the lambdas from the P space to the Y space. So all the calculation can be done in just one space. And then in the end, we are trying to update the lambda, then we just try to map it back to the P space here. So a little bit, so in the results from, uh, from the multi-wavelength inference with the Bayesian approach, this is um, uh, which is very much much better than the simple case where we kind of have this kind of maybe delta H is like ten times bigger than what we what we got here, and the other delta T and delta W also is kind of shrink the distribution from the previously being expanded amplified it by the measurement noise. But still, you can still see this kind of correlation scheme, which, is, which means that they still have some kind of measurement noise affecting the result. But still, the result is much more acceptable when we're looking at the exact number of the variance 
it looks very reasonable. It's still a little bit large, but it looks much reasonable when we're compared to the naive approach. And something we want to do next is that here we kind of have the values for the variance, but that is just uh, like a maximum likelihood. It's just, uh, it, it's just like the maximum values at the posterior distributions of the covariance. But we'll, we'll oops. But what we want to do is to um, actually have a sense of how how much of the confident interval we have for actually the uh, for the estimation of the variance. So the next step we want to do is trying to figure out the confident interval on all these kind of covariance, which is actually equivalent to trying to estimate the posterior distributions of the covariance of the person's variations, which will involve the variational inference approach. Here is a little bit of the pre preliminary result from still a 1D toy problems. And as you can see, at the beginning of this, uh, we're starting from a, just from the maximum likelihood estimation of the standard deviations of the 1D data with different noise level. And in the end, we were trying to do the virtual inference to optimize the elbow. And in the end, it is going to end up with a estimation of the standard deviations that still kind of have the same kind of um, estimations of the standard deviations, but with a much larger confidence interval, which makes sense because when you're having some of the data points may have a much larger kind of uh, noise level. So it makes sense that the actual estimation of the standard division is going to have more uncertainty. And the last thing I want to mention is the, um, the whole, uh, the more big pictures of what we're trying to do is that we want to use the infrared process variation distribution distribution map to try to optimize the design of the photonics, uh, for, uh, uh, the, the design of the photonic uh, devices or the circuits. So the idea is like uh, when we have the, the ideas of how the uh, variations is going to be in the, for the manufacturing, we can take it into account of the design so that we can try to evaluate how the device, uh, photonic device or the circuit is going to behave under these kind of variations. So that in the end, we can try to optimize the design so that it is going to be more robust to the manufacturing process variations. Yeah. So I think that's all for our presentation. Thank you.